Dallas, Texas, Friday the 22nd of November, 1963. President John F. Kennedy arrives aboard Air Force One. He is accompanied by his wife, Jackie. The presidential motorcade sets off through the city. A few minutes later, there is appalling news. Parkland Hospital, there has been a shooting. Parkland Hospital has been advised to stand by for a severe gunshot wound. At her, she walked into the hospital at her husband's stretcher side. The President of the United States is dead. The whole country goes into mourning. Nowhere more than in Boston, Massachusetts, where the Kennedys came from. But the next day, the numbed city is appalled by another murder. Joanne Graff, a 23-year-old dress designer, is found strangled in her apartment while watching the TV coverage. Throttled with her own black leotard, which was tied around her neck in a grotesque bow, she had become the 12th victim of the Boston Strangler, a killer who had terrified the city for almost 18 months. Neighbors told the police how a young man later described as being about 27 with slick, bushy black hair had gained entry claiming to be a repairman. The stranglings in Boston had begun at 77 Gainsborough Street in the Back Bay District on the 14th of June, 1962. A 55-year-old refugee from Latvia, Anne Slessers, who worked as a seamstress was sexually assaulted and choked with the cord of her housecoat. Her son, Juris, came to visit her and went up to the third floor apartment. As I walked up to the door and knocked, um, I was very surprised not to re receive a reply. So I waited around there, walked up and down the street for a while, and about, after about half an hour or 40 minutes, I, I decided that uh, uh, something may be wrong. And, uh, I, I was looking for the janitor in order to um, be admitted to the apartment. The janitor was not about, so at 7.45, Juris decided to break down the door. Well, actually, the door um, was not very difficult to break down. As a matter of fact, I gave it uh, one light uh, blow with my shoulder and uh, uh, gave it a second one, which was uh, a heavier blow, and the door just flew open. As he burst in, he almost fell over a chair which had been placed in the middle of the room. His mother was not in the living room, so he went into the bedroom and noticed that the dresser had been pulled open. Finding no sign of her, he strode down the hallway towards the kitchen and bathroom. It was in the kitchen that he saw her, lying on her back with her housecoat open at the front. The blue cord had been knotted tightly around her neck and tied into a clumsily shaped bow. He phoned the police, who arrived a few minutes later. The next murder took place 16 days later on the 30th of June in the Brighton area of Boston, where many elderly ladies have apartments. The victim was Mrs. Nina Nichols, a 68-year-old divorcee who lived in a fourth-floor apartment on Commonwealth Avenue. She interrupted a telephone conversation with her sister to answer the doorbell. When she failed to return, the janitor was alerted and found her body. She had been sexually assaulted and strangled with two of her stockings, which had again been knotted into a bow. There was no sign of a forced entry. What turned horror into panic was the discovery of a third victim in the town of Lynn, just north of Boston. The murder took place on the same day as that of Nina Nichols, but the body of 65-year-old Helen Blake was not found until the 2nd of July. Once again, she was almost naked and had been strangled with a nylon stocking with a bra looped through it. The bra straps had been knotted under her chin into a large bow. Like Anna Slessers and Nina Nichols, she had been sexually assaulted, though not raped, and her second-floor apartment had been searched and its contents left disturbed. There was no sign of a forced entry. The pattern and frequency of the killings was now too strong to be ignored. The police began to realize that they were not dealing with isolated killings carried out by separate people. 
they were now forced to admit that the murders could well be the work of one person, a serial killer with abnormal sexual tastes. Police Commissioner Edward McNamara's horrified comment was, my God, we've got a madman loose. The city's newspapers reacted with macabre nicknames for the killer, such as the Mad Strangler, the Phantom Strangler, and the Sunset Killer. Fear of the unknown killer paralyzed much of the day-to-day -day life in the city. Meter readers, researchers, and door-to-door -door salesmen found doors barred against them. Locksmiths and dog pounds found that business was booming. After each one of these stranglings, we get quite a spurt for all types of locks, mainly these chain locks, window locks. And we have never sold so many in such quantities. The factories have run out, the, the jobbers have run out of them, and uh, the comment in the store, everybody is very nervous. Well, as you can see from these empty cages, of which there are some 30 in this room, there has been a tremendous demand for animals of all sizes, both large and small, since the strangulation began. Also, we've noticed uh, quite an increase... Taxi drivers were also called on to give protection. Little old ladies seem to be afraid to walk across Beacon Hill, uh, Boston Common into Beacon Hill, and when we do get them home, they'll uh, ask us to uh, either wait in the cab until they're safely in their apartments, or on occasion, ask us to walk them to the door. More than a month passed without a similar killing. Then, on the 21st of August, in Boston's West End, a quiet, retired nurse, Ida Erger, was found strangled in her locked apartment. She had been dead for about two days. Her fifth-floor apartment could have been reached from neighboring roofs. The crime bore all the hallmarks of the previous killings with one grim variation. The naked body had been left so that it could be the first sight to greet anyone entering the room. Once again, there was no sign of a forced entry. By now, the press were confused as to how many victims the strangler had claimed. But on the 30th of August, another retired nurse was found strangled in the Dorchester area of the city. She was 67-year-old Jane Sullivan. Forensics proved that she had been murdered within 24 hours of the last victim. Her ground floor apartment looked out on the heavy traffic of Columbia Road. Yet her killer had managed to get in unnoticed and then escape, leaving her body undiscovered in the bathtub for 10 days. By now, after at least five known victims, the Boston Strangler had become an international sensation. What was the kinky attraction which older women seemed to have for the unknown killer? But any such theories were upset by the next round of killings. The first in the Back Bay area on the 5th of December, 1962. Sophie Clark was only 20 years old and had been conventionally raped as well as strangled with three stockings tied together. She was the first young victim, the first black victim, and the first that did not live alone. A student, she shared an apartment with two girls. The Huntingdon Avenue apartment was close to Symphony Hall, Jordan Hall, and Northeastern University. During the day, the area was packed with students, but at night, it became tougher as drunks and drifters moved in. Sophie's body was discovered by her roommate, laboratory assistant Gloria Todd. It was the habit of mine every day to call Sophie between the hour of 4 and 4.30. On this particular day, I tried to get in touch with Sophie to tell her that I would be home late. Well, when I called Sophie at 4.15, she didn't answer. And I thought it was very odd that she didn't answer the phone. And I just felt funny. So then I tried to call her again at 4.30. Still, there wasn't any answer. During the time that I was at work, I just had this funny feeling that something was wrong, and it was just bothering me why Sophie hadn't answered the telephone. So on my way home from work, it, the thought still plagued me, why hadn't Sophie answered? But when I got 
into our apartment building. It was very quiet, as usual. And I walked up to our fourth floor, and I noticed that our fuse box was open. But then I just proceeded on down to, the, down to our apartment door, and I noticed that the lights were on, you know, from the crack in the top of our door and the bottom of our door. So I knocked on the door as usual, and I called to Sophie. I said, it's Glow, open the door. And there wasn't any answer. So I knocked on the door again. I said, Sophie, it's Glow. I said, open the door. So then Miss Todd then tried the door and found it locked, not only with the usual locks, but one which they never normally used. When she opened this, she found Sophie sprawled on the floor. She just didn't move, and I was really panicked and shocked, and I called out her name, and I said, oh, God. And I just stood there for about a second, and I didn't go in because I didn't know if anyone was still in the apartment. So I just shut the door, and I ran down the stairs, and then I thought, well, what was I going to tell her mother? Not far away in another area frequented by students, the body of Patricia Bissett was discovered on the 31st of December, 1962. Patricia was a 23-year-old secretary who lived in a ground floor apartment by herself. Her employer, who had missed her at work, and the janitor found her body on her bed. She had been raped, strangled with stockings, and a nylon blouse. There was no sign of forced entry into her apartment. On the 6th of May, 1963, another student was found murdered. She was a 23-year-old from Cambridge named Beverly Salmons, who although also raped and strangled, was believed to have died from stab wounds in the throat. The police were now completely baffled, since the change in age group of the victims seemed to have destroyed all their theories. We've interrogated or interviewed over 5,000 people. We've screened over 2,500 uh, sex offenders who have been released from mental hospitals and jails and institutions. We have personally interrogated over 300 suspects. We've compared over half a million fingerprints with fingerprints that we have taken from the scenes of these crimes. We work in full cooperation with the police departments and law enforcement agencies throughout the state and throughout the New England area. As public outcry grew, one detective gave vent to the frustrations of a case which seemed to have become bogged down. Yeah, I'd like to talk to them. Bye-bye. The Clark case uh, broke on a uh, day in December, December the 5th, and as a result of a house-to-house, -house, door to door canvas made in the district, we located a woman who told us of an incident that happened shortly before the Clark girl was murdered. She told us about a man who came to her door, and a man, uh, this man discussed painting, painting the apartment for her. She became a little uh, concerned, and the man realized that she was upset, and he left. Now, after talking with this woman and showing several pictures, she picked out a photograph that she liked. And with the photograph, after considerable amount of work by all concerned, we did locate this particular man. However, his alibi was checked, and he had an ironclad alibi. And we had to let him go. It's sort of heartbreaking at times. We, we get our teeth into something, we get our foot in the door, so to speak, and something looks good, we stay with it, we hate to go home, and many a morning, three o'clock in the morning, the, the bottom falls out of our uh, pot lead, so to speak. That's when the frustration comes in. Yet the fact remained that there had now been eight known killings without a single breakthrough. Almost every killing that now occurred in the city, such as that of wealthy Mrs. Betty Goldberg, seemed to add to the confusion. Her strangled body was discovered by her husband, and police swiftly arrested and charged the handyman, who had been working for the Goldbergs. Unfortunately for them, he could not be linked to most of the other killings, since he had been in prison at the time.
the Boston Strangler claimed two more victims in 1963. The first, on the 8th of September, was Evelyn Corbin, aged 58. She was strangled manually, but the killer left his signature with a nylon stocking tied daintily around her ankle. Then, on the 23rd of November, the day after President Kennedy's assassination, came the killing of Joanne Graff. The task before the police seemed more impossible than ever, and it seemed possible that more than one person might be involved after all. We don't feel that the person or persons responsible for one or more of these crimes is necessarily 100% psychotic. We feel that the person may be normal in many ways. We also feel that it must be very difficult for a person to live or have this live with this, or have this live within themselves. We feel that they, they must have had or will tell someone about it. We would like to hear from that person or persons before harm comes to someone else. Desperate for results, the police were now prepared to consider the most unorthodox methods. In January 1964 came an extraordinary development when, at the suggestion of a local businessman, a Dutch psychic named Peter Herkos was called in. Despite some visions, little came of his involvement. Psychiatrist Dr. James Brussel announced that the police's quarry was an unmarried, paranoid schizophrenic. Others believed that he was homosexual. The final, 11th killing, which could definitely be identified by the police, occurred on the 4th of January. The victim was 19-year-old Mary Sullivan, the youngest to date. She was left tied up, naked, orally raped, and with a Happy New Year card jammed between her toes. Unknown to the police and only identified during the Strangler's subsequent confession were two other murders of 80-year-old Mary Mullen in June 1962 and of 69-year-old Mary Brown in March 1963. In all, he had claimed 13 lives. Then the murders ceased as suddenly as they had begun two years before. Gradually, the female population of Boston breathed a sigh of relief. But what appeared to be a new menace soon surfaced in Connecticut as a young man who became known as the Green Man because he always wore green work pants began talking his way into young women's homes, tying them up and raping them. In November 1964, the police linked the Green Man to a smooth-talking sexual con man who had served 11 months in prison four years earlier. His name was Albert DeSalvo, a mild-mannered 33-year-old maintenance engineer with a wife and two children one with malformed legs in casts, which her father tied on with special bows. Child of a brutal father, DeSalvo had run away to join the army. Honorably discharged after a charge of sexual misconduct against him had collapsed, he returned to Boston with his German wife. Diagnosed as schizophrenic, DeSalvo was sent after his arrest for observation to the hospital at Bridgewater State Correctional Institute. There, he boasted incessantly of his sexual conquests, and then he half boasted, half confessed to his cellmate, a murder suspect named George Nassar, that he was the famous strangler. Spurred on by a $10,000 reward for information about the strangler, Nassar contacted his lawyer, the famed defense attorney F. Lee Bailey. Persuaded by Nassar's insistence, Bailey agreed to meet DeSalvo. In a recorded interview, DeSalvo confessed not only to the 11 known murders, but to the Brown and Mullen killings, which the police had not known about. He talked about the Strangler's Knot, explaining that it was the one he always used for tying on his daughter's cast. Bailey had no hesitation in contacting the police, since with one or two minor inconsistencies, DeSalvo's description seemed faultless. As soon as they heard the tape, the police got onto the Attorney General's office. The investigators were in a quandary. 
Despite the accuracy of De Salvo's account and his eagerness to confess, there was no real legal evidence to convict him. In the absence of fingerprints or other forensic evidence, De Salvo's guilt would have to be proven. It was decided that De Salvo should undergo a proper interrogation, led by Assistant Attorney General John Bottomley, who had been put in charge of coordinating the Strangler investigation. He confirmed that De Salvo had a detailed knowledge of all the murders, including facts which had never been disclosed by the police. A legal battle now followed, since F. Lee Bailey was determined that De Salvo should not risk execution. The key was the question of his sanity. If Bottomley's investigation found that he was telling the truth, then psychiatrists would rule on whether De Salvo was sane or not. If insane, he would make a formal confession and plead not guilty in the hope of being sent to a mental institution. If sane, he would refuse to confess, and all proceedings would stop since there was no other evidence against him. The psychiatrist ruled De Salvo insane, but then the prosecution refused to accept that his confession could be made under the protection of a plea of his insanity. So Bailey came up with a brilliant legal move. De Salvo would stand trial for the Green Man case and not the earlier stranglings. Psychiatrists could then testify to his insanity. He could then be found legally insane without risking execution for the strangler crimes. Six months later, on the 9th of January, 1967, the Green Man trial opened with De Salvo pleading not guilty by virtue of insanity. Found guilty, De Salvo was sentenced to life imprisonment and sent back to Bridgewater Hospital. The decision was a severe mistake, since there were few facilities for treatment. Within five weeks, the strangler had escaped, causing a massive police hunt. The city and its surrounding areas were searched house to house. The two other prisoners who had escaped with him were swiftly found, but not De Salvo. Once again, the Boston Strangler had become national news, as he had intended. Two days later, De Salvo gave himself up without harming anyone. At an impromptu press conference after his recapture, he stated, I didn't bother anybody, and I never will. I didn't mean no harm to nobody. I did it to bring it back to the attention of the public that a man who has a mental illness and hires a lawyer and no one does anything about it. It was a plea for help, which the authorities tragically refused to consider. The Strangler was transferred to Boston's maximum security Walpole Prison. There, on the 25th of November, 1973, Albert de Salvo was stabbed to death in his cell. His fellow inmates closed ranks, and his killer was never identified.